So Max, we talked a little bit about your background and how you got into IPSC shooting and why you chose this as a sport. How did you end up being an open shooter? Was that something you planned to do or was it just something that came to be? Yeah, I think it's something that just came to be because honestly, when I first started, I was shooting in standard. Well, it wasn't really called standard division back then. It was just stock division, I guess you could say. Um, I first started with man-on-man -man steel challenge or steel target plate matches. So you would have five targets, I would have five steel, and the shooter who would knock them down the, you know, the fastest would be the winner. And we all started with iron sights back then. And then after a while, we realized, well, hey, we can, re we can reduce the recoil if we add in a compensator. So we screwed on a compensator. And then we thought we can acquire our sights faster if we use a red dot, and we put that on. So it just kind of evolved over time. Um, and to be honest, back then, uh, that's what a lot of the top guys were using. Rob, Todd, Jerry, those guys who were winning on a consistent basis, they were all shooting open because it was the fastest game. It was the right. most exciting game. It was kind of where everybody ended up. It was like the Formula One of the sport. Exactly. And, and that was kind of the time that I was coming into it. And that's how I got involved in the open game. And just, it was just created a big passion for that and kind of a need for speed, if you will. And I felt like that's where the best shooters were. And that's where I wanted to be. Do you think that's still true today? I think now... A lot, of sh a lot of shooters are, are simply mixing it up. Um, I think for a while we had a lull in the open game, um, you know, where maybe there was just one or two shooters that were winning every match for the most part. Uh, and Standard had a very big, wide range of great shooters. Now I'm seeing a lot of mix and, and flow of everywhere. And it's almost to the point where we have almost too many divisions, to be honest. I would love to see every top shooter competing in the same division going head to head. But it's not that way. Now everybody's kind of picking and choosing which they enjoy the most. Um, so to answer your question, do I think it's the same? I think open game is getting stronger again. Uh, because we have younger shooters getting involved. But there's a lot of the top open shooters at some point. I don't want to say that I'm one of the old guys yet because I, I, really, I really don't feel that way. But at some point, as you progress in your game, I see people retiring into other divisions. They retire into other divisions, correct. And I found it a little strange because, you know, at least from an optic standpoint, the open is the easier division to shoot. Right. For your eyes, you right. think you'd be able to see better, correct. But maybe the speeds there and the ability, the need to be able to be really quick on everything from transitions to movements to speed on, on really you have to have everything perfect. When the physical performance perhaps drops off a little bit, then it's easier to compete in the other divisions. Yeah, so the open division continues to be that spot where everything has to be perfect. Production, any type of iron sight division, standard, um, classic. I find that if you have a miss, if you have a delta, if you have a penalty, you can survive from that because somebody else will have it at some given point. But the open game, it's very critical to be just about perfect entering and exiting positions. It's a faster game. I feel like it's a young man's game and that's what makes it difficult. As you get older and progress, yes, it'd be easier on the eyes to have the dot, but the speed in which the younger guys are shooting and the perfection that they're doing it in, it makes it difficult to be on game. Do you think that Eric Rafael being, you know, in the last decade or more than that, the most dominant open shooter and having raised the bar in the open division to a point where if you wanted to compete with him, you really had to be up there and close to perfect in what you were doing. Do you think that he had a direct influence on making that happen in open and maybe less so in other divisions? I think so. I mean, obviously, regardless of which division he shoots in, he's, he's extremely dominant. He's very, very good at what he does, and other people will step up. To, to the challenge, you and I in particular, we spent many years oh, going right. after that guy, chasing him in Europe. We, we, and neither one of us shied away from it. That's it was a challenge that you and I both accepted, and um, and I think the same holds true today. You look at some of the to, some of the American production shooters, JJ Ricasa being one of them, um, with you know Eric shooting production those last year or two. JJ didn't shy away from it. He took that challenge to go on and go and, and, and go after it. And now with Eric in standard division, it's only going to continue to raise the game with a guy at the top of that game you want to chase and get to and, and one day beat and capture. Um, so I think, but going back to it, I think, you know, it's really the, the, the vision that you're most passionate about. Enjoy it, pick it, and just love doing what you do. So you don't have any plans to really shift your focus like Eric did really and focus on another division? Is that not something that your sponsors are interested to see you do? Yeah, you know, I'm very fortunate in that SIG and other sponsors haven't really told me we want you to do this and we need you to do that. I just kind of take it upon myself to see what we're doing from a sponsorship standpoint, from what my sponsors are doing that is, and, and see how I can help. For instance, last year uh, the P320 at SIG was kind of the big hit and it is the big hit still today for us. Um, I took that pistol and I went out and shot many matches with it and won some matches um, and then I won the Steel Nationals and the World Speed Shooting Championship, set the world record with it and, and those are the things that I did because I felt in my heart it was the right thing to do for the company, not because I was asked to. Um, but I'm still passionate about Open. That's 
that's my game. That I feel like that's my division, and, and I don't want to give it away until somebody comes and takes it from me. Do you feel the sport is very different in other divisions? I mean, is there a real difference between shooting open and production? Beyond the obvious technical skills that are required, do you still see it as the same game, or is the difference significant enough to say this is really a different activity on the range? I mean, I look at it shooting as shooting. It's, it's sights and a trigger, whether it be a dot or a, a front sight, um, 10 rounds or 30 rounds. It's just a different way of attacking the courses of fire. Maybe a little bit different mental game behind it, being, being, being a smart shooter is what I say. In other words, really maybe reducing the risk that you might be willing to take with a production gun versus an open gun. Um, but I feel it's, it's, it's all the same. I think once you get to a certain level, it's a draw, a reload, a transition, a movement. All, a lot of those same techniques and many of them will apply. Do you think there's an advantage for a beginner shooter who wants to get into the sport to avoid, say, starting in open and rather starting in one of the iron sights divisions? Yeah, I'm probably the total opposite to ask that question too because a lot of folks say, oh, I'm gonna start in production and I'm gonna work my way up to open. Well, I think if you do that, you're almost, you know, putting yourself at a disadvantage on the learning curve. The open game teaches you so much, and that's what I feel that many people, they shy away from it because it's maybe expensive, one thing, obviously, um, but they shy away from it because it's quite intimidating to have this large gun with an optic and a compensator and whatnot. But the fact of the matter is the dot will teach you so much more than the front sight will, meaning how to call your shots, how to see the sight lift off target. When you're entering a position, what is the dot doing? When you're shooting on the move, is the dot going crazy? Well, it's, gonna, it's a self-correcting tool. Bend your knees, get lower to the ground, the dot moves less, that means the muzzle's moving less, so you can shoot faster and accurate. Uh, but what's happening, the front side is doing that as well, but the naked eye can't see it. Right. It's a much larger object. So I feel the open game can teach you so much more about what's happening and really give you that aggressiveness that we need as action shooters and translate. I mean, you, you look at the top guys today, Eric being one, uh, open shooter for many, many years, production, dominant, standard, dominant. Um, you look at Blake Maguez, he grew up in the open game. He and I grew up together shooting. He was always shooting open. And he transitioned to standard. Now he's a standard world champ. Uh, Travis Tomasi, same thing. He shot open for a number of years. He transitioned. He's a standard world champion. So I think, and I know in my heart, the open game will make you faster and better at anything else that you try to do. That's interesting because I think a lot of coaches out there, a lot of people who present the sport to new shooters actually say the opposite. And they'll go and say, well, start in one of the iron sights, learn the basics with a gun that's easy to shoot, nine millimeter anyway, you know, steel sights, maybe not a huge investment, something that you'll transition from later on. But yeah, I can see the logic in what you're saying. It's a, it's a valid point. And you can take a, a nine millimeter production gun and put an optic on it for training, have a different upper to train with. And so you can use it as a training tool and it doesn't have to be a big, large investment either. Mm. Well, what are your thoughts on the caliber? I mean, you touched on the nine millimeter. There's a discussion going on amongst at least the shooters, whether or not we need to continue with the major power factors and all the difficulties of traveling worldwide with the custom loaded 38 super ammo and all that. Uh, you think the future is to just go minor nine millimeter on everything across the divisions and yeah I think eventually that will happen um, you know as, as we've seen it and IPSC is further along than USPSA is with this um, but we've went from 175 power factor down to 165 power factor to try to help reduce some of the pressure issues that that are that we've been seeing and, and as you mentioned when you travel somewhere it's not easy it's not easy to bring your own ammo. It would be a lot better or a lot easier if we can travel to a location and have uh, a round that we know is gonna run our gun, but more importantly, uh, is we don't have to worry about making that power factor floor. Um, so I'm a big 38 super guy, uh, super comp. I believe uh, it's a much better round for reliability purposes. Um, but at the end of the day, I, do, I wanna do what's ever best for the sport to grow and make it bigger and better for my children and beyond. Now, in the sport of USPSA and IPSC shooting, you've won a hell of a lot of matches, multiple US titles, area matches. Nobody knows how many exactly, I think, by now. The one, one, the, the, the one event, though, that you really had your eye on and took you a long time to achieve was the world shoot, and you won that back in 2014. I did, yes. So that must have been a really uh, exceptional achievement. Tell us a little bit about that and what it meant to you. Yeah, it was unbelievable, obviously. I mean, you and I have been friends for a long time, and I think you know more than anybody what I've been through and kind of the things that I've, I, I remember talking on the phone with you periodically saying, you know, how the heck can I do this? You know, what do I need to do? Where do I need to go? You've always been there to help me with it, but as an unbelievable achievement, I've been looking and chasing that for a long time. And it was kind of the last one that I was waiting to get. Um, not that I'm ready to retire yet, but 
uh, the, you know, the multiple nationals and steel challenges, and I've done a lot of things in the U.S. that no one's ever done, but winning that IPSC World Sheet was something I've always wanted. And when I was in my Army days, um, I did compete. I shot my first World Sheet in 99, so I was able to shoot a few World Sheets with the Army, but when I got out of the service, um, again, I'm able to kind of write my own program now and do my own thing. And my first World Sheet out of the Army, um, I, I just, I wouldn't say that I wasn't prepared for it, but um, I shot it and I did decent, um, maybe third or fourth or something, but I felt like I could have did more. And, and that's when after that world shoot is when I realized, you know, I am a pro, I am an athlete, I am, I can write my own schedule. So I sat down with my wife and I figured out exactly, I let her know what my plans were, my goals and what I wanted to do and how she can help me accomplish that and how that was going to help the family. Um, and once I did that, then I was able to put things into motion and I really took it to the, to the next level because nothing is guaranteed. And I realized that. I realized that, hey, this... Yes, I have great sponsors today, but at some moment, this could all change. The sponsors could say, we don't need a uh, pro shooter anymore. We don't need you anymore. We got this guy for, you know, for nothing, and we don't need you anymore. Um, and I, I just, I, I knew this was my time. 20, 2014 was here. It was now. I could see it. So I spent the two years prior uh, really working hard, getting a physical trainer and letting him dissect me and how I can do things to be better at what I do, but also dissecting my competitors and letting me know what they're better than me at and how we can fix my game to complement what they're doing or use my strengths to, against their weaknesses. So you spent two years focusing in preparing for that, for that match. I did, yes, I sure did. And, and nutritionists, um, breaking down my own game, I, speaking with you on the phone, mental game stuff. Um, I don't know if you remember, but we talked quite a bit that I'm very much a perfectionist and, and I let things kind of get in the way and when something goes south and how does that affect my performance? And there's a lot of pressure building up then, you know, if you spend that much time and effort and you're focusing on it all the time, when you get to the event, you have to be well prepared to deal with the pressure that you're putting on yourself at that event. Exactly, and, and there was no more pressure that I felt in my entire life than at that spot. And it was rough and, um, Everything was going great. You know, early on, I was winning. I started getting that 50, 60, 70 point gap that I always dreamed about that I would have at a world shoot. And I can start coasting until something happened. And then, boom, performance went down on one particular stage and I feel like I lost everything. Um, and it was that uphill battle for the last quarter of the match or so that allowed me to win. But it was, it was a rough go at it. And it was at that moment I felt so much pressure and, and not necessarily the pressure, I was, it was just, it was difficult. Um, but I, I would say that it was worth every second of it. Every, every, all the hard work and dedication that I put into it, I would do it 10 times again, just to get that one, one, that one world shoot win, even if it is by a point and a half, I don't care. Well, that doesn't matter, you know, nobody remembers the gap. It's the result that matters, it's first and second, there's a huge gap between them. Absolutely. You gotta be the winner if yeah. you want it to count. And you know, what's funny is that that entire pressure, um, you and I were talking on the range, it was on the very back portion of the range, it was the second to last day, and I could just feel my whole world kind of crumbling at that point, because I was leading, I was winning, everything was set up for me, I was supposed to win, I had all these sponsors pushing for me and helping me, um, and then I just started having a very poor performance um, you know, and, and I was, I, I, you and I were talking about, you know, the pressure that I was putting on myself at that point. And uh, we're lucky enough, I was able, I had dinner with yourself and Ellie and we were able that night and uh, just kind of talking and enjoying ourselves. And we had the next day off. Mm -hmm. And that was critical for me. That next day off, just to have that kind of friend time with you guys. <clears throat> and for my, my family came up that next day. Because my wife knew I was struggling at that point. I was just, you know, this is everything I wanted. It's everything I needed. It's right here in front of me. This, uh, it might not be here next year and three years from now, but I have the opportunity now to, to do it. I'm going to go for it and put everything I can into it. Um, so she came up to support me. And um, that, that last day, I finally put together an actual decent day of shooting. Um, and we got to the last course of fire, and it was like within a couple of points between us. I remember that last stage. Yeah, that was in the tree section there in the middle. Yeah, it sure was. And uh, I didn't feel any pressure whatsoever is the weirdest thing in the world everything inside my body I just felt like something big was gonna happen and it was just my time it was my turn and I just had a almost unbelievable perfect performance no pickup shots just I was super fast super quick and like one shot out of the A zone I think on the whole course and it was a large field course and it just it just all came together and connected for me to win by one and a half points or whatever it was uh, it was it meant the world to me so I know that was kind of a long answer to that but yeah um, it's everything I worked for it was a big event and you had to have a lot of things come together at the same time and to be able to do that under the pressure that you put yourself under in that type of event 
that's when it's really hard. You know, I can tell you from my experience because I've been shooting for a certain number of years where the shooting was a major part of my life and I was putting a lot of effort into it. And during those years when you go to compete, it, it's, it's easier because you've put a lot of work into it, but it's a lot harder because you're putting yourself under so much pressure. And later on, now that I'm primarily busy with Double Alpha and building my company and my brand, and I'm shooting because I enjoy it, when I go to a match, you know, I'm there to enjoy it. I love the shooting, and I, and, but because I haven't put all that huge effort into it building up to the match, there isn't that same tension and there isn't that same pressure on you and it makes it easier. Mm -hmm. It really makes it a lot easier. So I can, I can relate to what you said, that must have been a real battle. Yeah, and, and it's just the, the amount of pressure you put on yourself and, right. and any time I have a firearm in my hand, it could be a rifle, it could be a pistol, it could be a shotgun. People expect certain things from me because it's what I do and that adds to the pressure. But yeah, again, you have to put that to the side and focus on what you can control and do your very best to, to control that. Um, but I'm fortunate that I was able to put myself in a situation because I didn't know if 2017 would be guaranteed. You know, there's no guarantee. There's a lot of changes that are always happening with every one of my sponsors and what they're doing. And I thought I, I, I couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Had I won or lost that world shoot, it didn't matter. I didn't want to be able to look at myself. I wanted to be able to look at myself in the mirror at the end of the match and say I did everything I could to win. What can I do differently next time to be better rather than uh, yeah, I could have dry fired a little more. I could have did this because for the last three or four world shoots, I've been three, uh, third or fourth place. Uh, that's pretty good. So, but this time I wanted to put everything I could into it and uh, sacrifice everything 100% into it. You bet. But speaking of pressure, you're also known uh, as a steel shooter and you've won the steel challenge several times. In fact, you've won it more than anyone else, I think. Yeah. So how do those two compare? I mean, obviously, technically they're different, IPSC shooting or USPSA shooting or steel challenge, but at the highest levels, which do you feel is more difficult mentally? Um, believe it or not, mentally steel challenge is pretty difficult. Um, I remember my- I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my first steel challenge uh, was 2000, I think, and I was absolutely nervous. My knees were literally shaking in the box. I never felt that kind of pressure before. Because see, in IPSC, you can really you can release it. You can release it. Yeah. You can run, you jump, you, you can, you're thinking about what's next and what's going on. Steel Challenge is just you and your brain in the box. And all it is is a draw and transition. It's the simplest sport you can do. But it's the pressure that comes with it. It's the five runs and you get one throwaway. And that's great until your throwaway becomes your first run. And then you have a miss on your first stage. You know, you hit the stop plate before you hit an additional plate. And you have a three second penalty. It's that experience now, what do I do next? Um, so that helped me greatly in, in IPSC shooting, the, the amount of pressure that you put on yourself in that box and the mental, that, uh, the mental game that it takes to get out of those issues uh, helped greatly. Yeah, I can't imagine. And I remember Casey, speaking to Casey, who's another phenomenal steel shooter, and I remember him saying to me once that in the starting position he always puts his fingers up against his earmuffs because he doesn't want everybody to see how bad his hands are shaking. Right. I've never forgotten that. <laughs> it's very true. You know, some of the guys think the top guys are not dealing with that tension, but hell, they're dealing with it even more. It's, it's big time. And I tell you that the adrenaline rush that you feel in that box is like no other. And, and actually, you can use it to your advantage. And that's when I started to be able to, to win in Steel Challenge, when I learned how to use that adrenaline and use that nervousness to my advantage and I could do things in the match that I could not produce in practice because of the adrenaline and the yeah just that, that feel of wanting to go fast and that burning in your stomach that you don't typically get to duplicate or replicate in training. And if you look at yourself objectively as a professional shooter what do you feel your strengths are and are there any points where you feel well if I would improve that I could elevate my game even higher? Absolutely I think we all have things we can work on and do better. Um, I'm not going to say all my weaknesses here because I don't want everyone to know them. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, I think my strength is, is speed with acceptable accuracy. That's what I do. It's what I've always known since I was a kid, meaning large field courses, open targets, 15 meters and in, um, and I can just go, just be me, be explosive. Um, that's kind of natural for me. So anytime I see those type of events or those type of stages, um, that's when I usually try to, you know, I may may just kind of take my game to the next level a little bit and pick up a few more points. Um, I wouldn't say I necessarily have a weakness on partial targets or long range shots. I would just say that that used to be a weakness of mine years ago um, because when I was living in New Orleans when we first started shooting and competing we had a 15 meter indoor range and that's all we had. Um, so that's all I kind of worked on and everything, the club matches, the lower level matches, they were all easy, close, big targets. Um, but as I found myself going to the area matches and the national matches, Things are not that way. There's partial targets, there's long range targets, so I trained very hard on those 
to get better. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that's a weakness anymore, but I would say that that's something that I'm cautious of. Um, and then I still feel like I need a lot of work on my one-handed shooting, whether it be right-handed or left-handed. Um, that's something that many of us don't train on very often because we don't see it very often. Yeah, and I think that's something that a lot of shooters end up, you know, they go to the range to train and they want to enjoy their time there. Yeah. And they don't necessarily set up the more difficult things to shoot. They set up the stuff they enjoy. Yeah. And I always remember thinking about Eric back in the day. I used to shoot a lot against Eric Rafael and I'd look at his shooting. And anytime I saw a weakness in his game, he obviously recognized it as well. And he would come back a month or two later and he would have been so much improved in that. Mm -hmm in that element and you could just see the way that he and his dad working together would analyze what he was doing and he would then focus on his weaknesses and he would come back and he'd, and he'd make them into strengths and I think that over time just made him the, the great technical shooter that, that he became. Yeah, and that takes a lot as you mentioned because many of us want to go to the range and see positive results because it's fun but I, I, I prefer seeing those negative results and it gives me the ability to to really, I enjoy it. I enjoy climbing the ladder. So I, I do. I, that's one of the parts of my games that I want to continue to get better is one-handed shooting. Yeah. And of course, as one of the leading shooters here in the U.S. in the sport worldwide, you, you probably have a lot of young aspiring shooters come up to you and they say, you know, Max, what do I need to do to be the next Max Michelle? What do you tell them? Tell them to get away, find a girlfriend. No. Do <laughs> yeah, do something else. Um, I mean, there are some up and coming rise, rising stars. I mean, a lot of good yeah, I saw Ross Kincaid shooting at the, uh, at the Nationals last time. We all shot together on the yeah. Super Squad. Absolutely. Man, for a kid that age, I was, I was really impressed. Yeah, you know, he's unique. He's, if, if you were to ask me if I could pick one, yeah, Kincaid would be the one that I would pick only because um, I've worked with him from the beginning and I've seen him kind of grow. He's maybe 16 now, I think, but when he was 13, he had no idea what we were doing in, in speed shooting his father called me and said hey we we know you're the SIG guy and we want to do some training with you they're from Reno Nevada can we come out to Louisiana and train I said sure I have a course this date so they came in and he was shooting a 226 um, you know double action single action gun and and he was doing great in the course and then I saw him maybe a year later with an open gun and I thought oh crap what did I do you know and and now he's amazing so um, you know there's uh, the open game kind of pulls the, those younger faster more explosive shooters so you can see really quickly who's those who the rising stars are uh, and he's going to be he's going to be a special one for a long time he just finished I think fourth or third I think it was fourth fourth at the U.S. Nationals um, at a young age and he just needs experience now. I see a lot of myself in him. I'm just like, you know, there, there's several other shooters that are, that, are, that are getting there or maybe that are in kind of in the general area where I'm at now, semi-pro style of a shooter that, you know, you see them kind of grow over the years. I'm very fortunate to work with a lot of junior shooters um, and, and many of them are great kids as well and great parents, but I've, I've worked with so many junior shooters and see them progress. Uh, Kincaid's definitely one of those ones that you can tell will be special. And I always knew he would be. Um, but I, you know, I, I tell him all the time, you know, someday you're going to be special, you're going to be great. And uh, maybe he takes offense to that because he's already fourth in the nation. But what I mean by that is, is I see a lot of myself in him where, yeah, I finished third and fourth a lot over the years, but it takes uh, 10 years of doing that to, yeah, really, be able to really be able to win it as well, you yeah, know? Huge like gap between being third or fourth, being potentially able to do it, right. to being able to win it consistently. Yeah, yeah. And, and consistently was a key word. There's, there's some great shooters that I know that uh, I compete with on a monthly basis that they've won two three national championships and that's great that's amazing but doing it consistently maybe seven or eight times out of ten years that's a different part of the game you think it's going to be easier to be a professional shooter in the next decade than it has been in the last previous or even two decades ago yeah i don't know so you know to be honest um it's it's tough it's a tough business to be a pro shooter because there's a lot of pressure you put on yourself as you mentioned uh, there's a lot of pressures from the sponsors and there's so many things going on in the world today with firearms that it becomes difficult to to go out there and honestly to, to do it. Um, you know, guns are bad in the eyes of some people and, and that's a struggle that we continue to fight and guys like myself, guys like you, other well-known shooters out there, we need to make sure that we're, send, we're sending the right message with firearms uh, so that way the newer, younger generation will have it easier. It is getting more accepted um, on TV in some, some degree. There's some different TV shows out there now. Social media is a really big deal that's allowing us to kind of show what guns are capable of other than just school shootings and, and random acts of, uh, you know, violence, um, that, that it's not the guns that are doing that, it's the, the people behind the guns and their issues that they're having mentally and whatnot. Um, so I hope that there's a thing, you know, that there's a way that we can grow it and make it bigger. And I hope that I can have an impact on that. That's one of my goals is to, um, is to take shooting to the next level, get outside industry sponsors involved, get outside people involved. Uh, because, yeah, maybe I won't be able to, you know, 
reap the benefits and maybe my, my children may not be able to, but maybe their children can. Um, so I definitely want to continue to grow this thing as big as I can get it, not just for me, but for the next generation. I think that IPSC or USPSA should consider making changes in the way the sport is shot or the way it's scored or the way it's presented for the media. You know, what, do you have any ideas on what could be done to make it more attractive, to make it more marketable? Yeah, I think one thing is it's difficult to, to follow along with it right. as a spectator. Um, us as top level competitors, we can, it's fun. It's like, a, it's like a math problem. You have to figure it out and is it better to do this or that? I enjoy that part of the game. But it's at some point we have to look at this and change. And IPSC, again, is, is much further ahead of USPSA, I believe, in this regard that we have humanoid style targets in USPSA. Get rid of it. You know, I'm a big believer in, hey, I don't have to shoot the guy in the head. Let's take the head off and make it an actual target. Many of us in the U.S. say, no, we're in the U.S., damn it, and we can do what we want to do because this is our country and we have the greatest country in the world and we're going to do this. But I think times are changing. Let's change with the times. Let's grow. More of a sport and less tactical or, or you know, Correct. combat oriented. Exactly. We can still be explosive, dynamic. We can still run an obstacle course with a handgun. That, that would be amazing to see that on ESPN, to see it in the Olympics. Uh, extreme sports. That's what we are. We're an extreme sport. But let's change it from a scenario-driven hostage situation um, to from a tactical situation to more of an, a sporting event. Sure, sure. I mean, I remember shooting matches here in the U.S. where you started prone holding a knife and you need to stab it through the target before you can get up and start or take a grenade and throw it through a window and that activates or releases a target. You know, this is the kind of thing that many people feel is attractive in the game and makes it more real life. But I, I think there is a marketing problem with that, and certainly outside of the U.S. I mean, where, 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 where I'm shooting, you can't do that. You know, I clearly remember one of the first times I came to shoot in Holland and I, I joined some buddies who were shooting in a club, one of the ranges, and we went there to shoot in the evening and we were shooting the man-shaped targets. There wasn't yet the classic, uh, there was still, there were, there was metric targets. And we were done shooting and we crumpled up the targets and I threw them in the bin there and they said to me, oh, no, 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 we don't leave those here. We've got to take them with us because we don't want all the clubs who use the range and all the people who shoot here to see the shape of the targets we're shooting at. And that was within the shooting community how unaccepted it was. And I think here, of course, that situation is, is nowhere near as, as extreme, but there is definitely something to be said in favor of trying to make the sport more mainstream yeah. and more appealing to the, right. to the, to the, to the non-gun crowd as well, right. to grow it that way. And I guess that's the direction I'm going in as well. That's what I'm saying is that I love what we do. I don't want to change the game, but I want to change the way people look at the game. And to me, that's, the, that's more exciting. You get more shooters involved, you grow this thing, make it bigger and better. Um, and not only that, you know, you can, from the standpoint of a scoring system, it's difficult to follow. I really enjoy the pro-am format here in the States. We have steel one match, only. it's still only you shoot. You see, the, you see the targets fall, you get a hit. The targets don't fall, you don't get a hit. So a guy gets 20 seconds, let's say, to go run through a course of fire. Everybody gets the same par time. You knock down 32 targets, I knock down 31. Well, you have a lead and we go on and it accumulates. That's an easy way. Um, also a time plus scoring system. It's something I always do in training um, because it's easy and faster for me to see if I'm doing the proper things that I need to do with whatever technique I'm working on. Uh, but time plus being if there's a score, uh, if there's a tar, uh, let's say a, a zone, C zone, D zone, well, every C zone you add a quarter of a second to your time. A D zone you add a half second. A miss you add three seconds. It's a very easy time plus scoring system format. Whatever it is, it may not be that. But as people are running through the course of fire, they quickly know 27 alpha, 3 Charlie, 2 delta, and you did it in 14.26 seconds, you quickly do the math and you know where you're at. So maybe people can follow that way as well. Um, but yeah, so ideally, I just want to get as mainstream as possible. I'm trying to make it as popular as possible. That also increases the number of people who are interested in it. That translates into dollars and sponsor interest. Absolutely. And then you can have more professional shooters in the future. Exactly. exactly. Outside industry sponsors is going to be key for us at some point.